When I was in high school, I fell in with a new group of friends. This was the early 2000s. Goth and emo was still pretty big at the time. I would describe my group of friends as that. Goth and emo. One friend of mine, Michael, and I had really hit it off from the beginning. My home life wasn't really the best, and Michael could really relate to that. We both had sisters who our parents loved and spoiled while we felt really neglected and ignored. Michael was a little weird at times. He claimed to be a Satanist, but nobody ever really took him seriously. Another friend of mine, Devin, was also into Satanic things and instantly bonded with Michael as well. The three of us were inseparable after that. We would get together, smoke weed, and drive around messing with people. And one time we even broke into the high school after hours and vandalized lockers. It was stupid teenage delinquent fun. I started to feel differently about my friends following one party we went to, however. It was around Halloween during my senior year, October 2009. Michael had invited Devin and a few of our friends over for a party one weekend when his parents weren't home. We live in a small town where nothing really happens, but Michael lived in a busier suburban part, a new subdivision. While the rest of us were living in double wides and ranchers, Michael lived in a new two-story house. It was funny that a kid from this environment claimed to be so emo. At the party, it was the typical fair. Snacks, drinks, a little weed, some pills, and alcohol. Michael then promised everyone a little surprise for later. The party went as expected. Loud music and the occasional drug-fueled argument. What happened next, I'll never forget. It was around 11 p.m. when Michael and Devin told everyone to gather around in the basement. Michael's dad had converted the basement into a gaming-slash-rec room, something right out of that 70s show. We all gathered around the seating area, and my two best friends showed us the surprise. Inside a closet was a woman. She was tied up and gagged with a shirt. Instantly, we had all recognized this woman as Rose, a local vagrant woman who collected cans and was known to dabble in drugs all over town. Michael, what the hell's going on here? I asked as others sat looking very confused. Joey helped us get her. Michael replied, we're going to have some fun tonight. Devin was smiling as he had started passing around darts to the party goers. Our first event of the night, the human dart board. Seriously, what the fuck is wrong with you? A girl in the room had asked. We were all in shock. This was too much, even for Michael. Devin proceeded to throw a dart. It stuck in Rose's arm and she had let out a muffled cry through the shirt. How the hell did you even get her down here? I asked. Michael said that he and Devin had invited her and Joey in to smoke and drink with them. Joey was also another local vagrant. Joey had the mind of a 12-year-old, and Rose was a junkie. I'm not surprised they took up the offer. Joey had apparently helped tie up Rose and put her in the closet. She'd been there for a day and nobody knew. Who's next? Michael asked. After me, that is. Michael threw a dart and hit Rose just below her chest. She cried out in pain again. This was sick, but others actually took part in this twisted game. By the time it was over, Rose had ten darts sticking out of her body. I refused to play. Michael had his older brother blocking the only exit. He had been filming the entire night on his camcorder, and he threatened to show the video to our parents or the police if we attempted to leave. We were being blackmailed at this point. So, are you guys ready for the next game? Devin asked. He and Michael pulled Rose into the floor, and then sat her in the middle of a crudely drawn chalk ring Michael had drawn. They then injected her with what Michael claims was heroin, but nobody really knew. Tonight we sacrifice an untouchable to the king, our lord Satan. Michael stated, Devon, the instruments please. Devon had a black bag in his hand. When he opened it, we had saw an array of knives. Kitchen knives, butter knives, etc., this was sick and twisted. Michael had done some questionable things before, but this was way too much. A blood sacrifice to please the king. Michael took a kitchen knife and cut a small slice into Rose, and she cried out in pain. A few of the girls in the room had tears in their eyes, and my stomach was all in knots. 
I was a little high, but even I knew this was fucked up. What happened next literally made me puke. Michael actually licked the blood off of the knife. The blood of a homeless junkie who has been God knows where. He and Devin then kissed one another, sharing their offering. I knew that Michael was by, but this behavior from Devin was completely out of nowhere. I really regretted introducing the two. Devin had been weird, but this was all just way too far. Other party guests actually took turns cutting on Rose and licking her blood. These were older guys and one girl. I had no idea who they even were. The rest of us, myself, which was two guys and three girls, refused to take part in this. Suddenly, someone had whispered in my ear, I'm gonna call the cops. Fuck that video. It was a girl that I knew from school. She was one of the few of us who had a cell phone, and she had hidden it in her purse. Cover me, please, she told me. Rose continued to cry out in horror as the Satanists did whatever they were doing across the room. I sat there hoping that they wouldn't actually try and kill her. Please don't let them actually kill this woman in front of me, I told myself. The girl dialed 911 and got a hold of the police. She quietly informed them where we were and what was going on. Then I saw a huge knife being lifted above Rose. No, they aren't going to kill this woman in front of me. I then stood up and yelled, Stop! Seriously! This is just way too fucking far! They looked at me surprised, but as though they were in a trance. They turned back to Rose, while Michael then replied, Blood must be pain to the king, in an extremely creepy and cringy voice. I ran over and I knocked him to the ground. Devin tried stopping me, but I was able to push him off me. Suddenly, the girl yelled out that the police were on their way. Then all hell broke loose. The so-called Satanists had ran for the door. Michael's brother moved and let them all out. Devin ran to leave Michael alone down in the basement with me and Rose. I had to guard her so he wouldn't try anything. He was beyond unhinged at this point. The cops showed up a few minutes later. The girl and I had stayed behind to tell them everything that happened. Rose was taken away in an ambulance. She survived, but after that, we never really saw her walking around town anymore. I have no idea what happened to her. Michael and Devin were both arrested and sent to juvenile detention. I later graduated and I cut off all ties with them. I even moved away out of pure fear that they might try looking for me. Who knows what people like that might try. Michael's idiot brother kept the tape in his camcorder, and the police were able to use it to track down the others who had taken part in this sick ritual, including high school kids. My only advice is to really be careful with who you choose to hang around with. You never know just how batshit crazy someone claiming to be your friend actually is. Right off the bat, I want to say that this story is very, very dark. This happened the fall before COVID. I'm a 27-year-old guy, and my younger brother, who's 23, was the victim of the story. Every year, there's a small town about an hour and a half away from us that has a very popular festival every fall that people from all over the state come to take part in. I'm not going to say the name of the town for privacy reasons. Another important thing to note about this particular town is that it's a complete cell phone dead zone, which will be important for later. So anyway, it was a warm Sunday, and my younger brother and I, an older brother who's 30, decided to go to the festival. I remember us being most excited about the classic car show that they were going to be having there since me and my brothers are really into cars. So we make the hour and a half drive there. Now, because of how small this town is and its layout, we had to park in the middle of the parking lot for the public park that was across the river from the town, which meant that we had about a 15 minute walk and had to cross a bridge to get into the town. We didn't mind though since the weather was perfect outside. We parked in the parking lot and began heading to the first of the two bridges that we had to cross. Right before we arrived at the first bridge, a very pretty Asian lady probably in her late 20s to early 30s came up to us asking how to get to the festival. We told her how to get there, but she still didn't seem to understand. So us being overly nice guys decided to let her follow us to the festival, which I now know was a huge mistake. So we began walking towards the festival, and this lady seemed really nice, and my younger brother was especially taking a liking to her. We arrived in the small town the festival was in, 
and me and my older brother wanted to go and check out the class and car show really bad since that was the big thing that we had came here for. The lady said that she was looking for a particular place in the town where a certain festival event was being held, but she didn't know how to find it. Because we've been here before, we knew exactly where it was, and my younger brother said he would take her there and then meet us at the car show afterwards. We agreed, and little did we know that was the last time we would see my little brother for almost two years. Anyway, so me and my older brother headed to the car show and then began admiring all of the cars. Of course, we completely forgot about our younger brother as we were very distracted admiring all the cars and talking with the owners. Before we knew it, it was almost noon and we realized that our younger brother hadn't come to find us yet. We tried calling him but quickly realized there was no cell phone service in the town. We weren't too concerned just yet. So we decided to go eat lunch at one of the restaurants in town. After sitting down and placing our order, I had looked out the window and I had noticed a payphone across the street and I decided to go try it and see if I'd have better luck getting through it. I went across the street to it while we were still waiting for our food and I had tried it out, but the call didn't go through. So my younger brother most likely didn't have any bars in this town either. I hung up the phone and went back to the restaurant to which we got our food and began to eat. After having lunch, we had decided to walk around and check out some of the vendors while trying to keep an eye out for our younger brother, though with the amount of people there, it was really difficult. So by 4 p.m., we were getting pretty worried at this point, and we didn't know what to do. So we had walked to one of the local police officers who was monitoring the festival, then explained the situation to him. He radioed to the other officers to be on lookout for our younger brother. But again, with the amount of people here, that would really be difficult. By 6 p.m., we were walking all around the town to try and find him, but we didn't see any sign of him anywhere. It was at this point where we weren't really enjoying the festival anymore, and we just wanted to find our younger brother and go home. By 8 p.m., it was starting to get dark, and we had decided to head back to our car and see if we could wait for him there, and that he might show up. When we got to our car... I checked my phone again and still had no bars, so I couldn't call anyone. Since I had driven all three of us there, I didn't want to leave and have my younger brother stranded there, so we just sat there in the car for a while. Well, at around 9pm, it was now completely dark and still no sign of him. We were the only car left in the parking lot at this point, and a park ranger pulled in next to us and told us that the park was closed and that we had to leave. We explained the situation to the ranger, and he said he would radio the local police department as well. We gave him our phone numbers, and he said he would sit in the slot for a while and see if anyone matching my brother's description would show up. Of course, we didn't want to drive an hour back home at this point just yet, so the ranger suggested that we get a room at a nearby hotel so that we weren't too far away, and we agreed. We drove to a nearby hotel, and luckily they had two rooms left, and we got one of them. When we got in the room, I had called the ranger to let him know which room we were in just in case he needed to contact us, and I gave him the number for the phone on the nightstand in our room. I took a shower and then sat on the bed and connected to the hotel's Wi-Fi so I could check and see if my brother had left me any messages, but there was nothing there. I tried calling him again, but it just went straight to voicemail. I left him a message telling him where we were, and I even texted him. I left my phone on and we had tried to go to sleep. But needless to say, we didn't sleep very well that night. So the next morning, the first thing I did was check my phone, and so did my older brother. And to my surprise, there weren't any messages from our younger brother. No voicemails, no texts, nothing. As you can all expect, we were very concerned at this point. I mean, he typically always kept in touch with us. That morning after breakfast, we immediately went to the local police department and filed a missing person report, and they put out an alert. That day was Monday, and the festival was over, and the town was cleared out, and the roads were all back open, so we decided to drive around town to see if we could find him anywhere. Now, the town wasn't very big, only about eight blocks and five roads that run parallel to each other. We didn't find anything, though. We even checked the outskirts of town, but never found anything. Over the next week, we had stayed in that hotel while searching. Me and several friends had tried every possible way to contact him. Messenger, email, video calling, everything, but got no response. 
All of my messages on Messenger were left unreceived but not read, so I knew his phone had to be on somewhere. I even posted on Facebook about the whole thing and told everyone I knew to keep an eye out. After about a week, my older brother and I hesitantly went back home because we couldn't take any more time off work. Over the next few months, we even put up flyers around that town hoping someone would find him, but we never got any leads. Well, then COVID hit, and the police department in that town had to call off the search completely because they had more important things to worry about now, and they also had all of their funding for the department cut. Yeah, thanks a lot, Mr. President. So a year goes by, and then two, and then we hear nothing, and by then we had pretty much given up all hope completely. That is, until one day we got a call literally a week before Christmas. It was the police department in that town, and what they told me absolutely horrified me. Well, apparently they had done a drug raid on a trailer home in a trailer park on the outskirts of town after getting tipped off by some neighbors that saw a drug deal happening. The raid was supposed to happen a year ago, but due to budget issues, they couldn't do it until now. Well, when they raided the trailer... One of the things they found was my younger brother tied up in one of the bedrooms, severely dehydrated, malnourished, and badly injured. Well, when they took him to the hospital and questioned him, he said that the same Asian lady from the festival had taken him down an alley, where three guys had jumped him and then threw him in the back of an old ice cream truck before taking him to the trailer. They had violated him repeatedly, used him as a slave for some really bad things, and had even drugged him repeatedly. My brother spent three months in the hospital recovering, and is still in therapy to this day. The police department said that it was likely part of some big human trafficking ring that they used the Asian girl to lure in victims. Apparently these guys had also lived in that trailer for almost 15 years, and nobody had any clue they were up to this. You're probably wondering how they went unnoticed. Well, if you live in a less desirable area like this trailer park, there's an untold saying not to snitch on your neighbors, as it only puts a huge target on yourself. Apparently, though, a new family had just moved into the trailer right next to these guys, and they didn't get the memo, thankfully. The three guys were arrested and sentenced to life in prison on multiple charges. The Asian lady was never caught, as she wasn't there when the raid happened. One of the guys actually died in prison a month after being arrested due to years of drug use, and I honestly don't feel one bad thing for him, so rot in hell. The trailer they found him in was demolished a week after the guys had been arrested, and it was an absolute horrible condition. We haven't gone back to that town since, and we most likely never will. Always be careful who you trust, as even the most seemingly nice people can be up to no good. In this case, some very bad people used a pretty Asian lady to lure in victims. The worst part is wondering how many previous victims these people had already used and gotten away with. My name is Jeffrey. I'm a 22-year-old male who lives in a small, relatively safe town. The story happened back when I was only about 9 years old, back when my parents lived in a condominium. I used to play outside with a few of my neighborhood friends pretty much every day, riding bikes, playing tag, you get the point. I would also watch a lot of scary things like movies or videos, so I would always be paranoid whenever I was in a room alone or in the dark. The layout of the condominium is a triangle-like shape, with a few rows of houses facing a long parking lot. There would only be about 10 to 15 cars in the lot at a time, but it would also not be unusual to only see two or three cars at a time. The weekly garbage truck would come every Wednesday morning at around 8 a.m. At the time, it was 9 p.m., and it was just me and my 16-year-old sister at home, as my mom was out for dinner. I don't have the best relationship with my sister, as we would always fight and get into arguments with her. I would sit on the sofa and watch television every night, as it was just a routine thing for me. But as I was watching TV, I saw from the corner of my eye a figure outside of my window. The windows of my condo were the tall rectangular windows facing the parking lot. They were big so you could see everything outside, but anyone outside could also see into the house. All of a sudden, I saw this figure. I turned my head to face the window, now scared shitless. I was then questioning myself on what to do in this situation. 
It was about two minutes of me staring out the windows from the couch waiting for something. I finally resumed after watching the TV after what felt like hours of staring, but then I saw the figure yet again. But this time, I saw that it was an old man, maybe in his late 50s, staring at me as he slowly passed my window. Now I was scared. I went into my sister's room to tell her what I've just seen, but unsurprisingly, she disregarded what I said and just told me to get out. It was about 10 minutes after I saw the old man from the window when I heard the ear-piercing sound of the landlight phone then ringing. When I answered the phone, it was my mom. She was telling me to take the garbage out so we didn't have to in the morning. I don't know why I did, but I decided to not tell my mom because I didn't think it was a big deal because my sister told me to just stop being a baby. So I did. All of the garbage and recycling from all of the condo members would go in a pile off to the side of the end of the parking lot. At the time, it was close to winter, so it would already be pitch black out. Me being a paranoid nine-year-old, I was always very hesitant to go outside alone but I knew I always had to go eventually. Well, when I got outside, the only light was a street lamp in the parking lot that barely even illuminated anything. I made my way down the sidewalk, scared like every time I take the trash out. On this night, there were a lot of cars in the parking lot that I was always scared about because I would think someone was gonna jump out and kill me. An average childhood fear. But as I had dumped the trash and made my way back, my nightmare came true when I saw the head poking out from between two cars that were less than 15 feet away from me. The only part of them I could see was the forehead and eyes, but I could still see the person. I made it out to be the same man from earlier. I stared at them, frozen in fear, questioning myself on what to do. But that's when I heard the person talking in a loud whisper. Hey, come here. I want to talk to you. I started to shake as I was still frozen as the man was still whispering to me. The head then slowly lowers down from the view behind the car. I made the decision to run as fast as I could past the car. That's when the most terrifying thing I've ever experienced happened. As I ran by the car, I could see the man and two other elderly women all crouched behind the car smiling at me. The women were completely naked while the man was wearing some weird bunny clothes. I could hear them running after me while screaming, but I was way too fast for them, and I made it back to my house and then locked the door. I was in tears, yelling at my sister to help. I called the police and told the operator that there were some old people chasing me. She told me to lock all of the doors and stay on the line until the police arrived. They arrived in a relatively short time, but of course, the old creepy people were already gone. They called my mom and she rushed home immediately. The police asked me a few questions before leaving to take a look around the neighborhood, but they never found them. That was over 10 years ago now, and I haven't seen them since.